But I have a friend who watched one of my recent videos. He's like, you know, the architecture might as well be like the dark arts. He's like, I, I have no idea how it comes into being. Rather than just the end product, the glossy photos, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's so much more interesting to me to, to learn about how you arrive at that final product. Growing up, you know, I, I think that is like where my love of maybe design began. And it started probably with drawing. I remember walking to Main Street in Zanesville to the public library and finding a book. Uh, and the book was called, you know, Tree Houses That You Can Build. The drawings in the book are amazing. And it just captured, captured my attention. When I see your sketches, they, they make me want to be a better architect. They make me want to draw. They, they draw me in, in a way, probably not dissimilar to the way that the sort of treehouse book drew you in. But I see that and I'm like, yeah, that's why I did this because I want to be able to draw like that. And I look at my sketches and I say, I, my sketches don't measure up to this. For people who look at your sketches in the same way that I do and, and find them inspiring, is it literally just finding inspiration somewhere and trying to copy or do you do what are resources that people can use if they're interested in kind of replicating your style like how would someone do that you know what i i tell our staff members and i tell my daughter and you know architecture students i've run into is just don't stop drawing i i feel like you will draw as well as you drew when you stopped drawing so you could be 50 if you stopped drawing when you were eight, you'll still draw like an eight-year-old. So, you know, just keep drawing. Yeah. Just don't stop. And as much as it, it's like daunting to look at the blank piece of paper, be loose about it. Sure. And, you know, use a fat marker and have fun. If you want to do good design and, it, and you can be fasted at the same time, you don't have to, like, explain it to anybody. You know, I worked at a 50-person firm out of school. Mm -hmm. And... It was not as design driven as we are now. So if you wanted to do design, you had to be quick. Otherwise you had people saying, hey, you're spending too much time there. I worked for a 150 person firm right out of school and I had the very same experience. I started modeling this stuff in 3D and then hand sketching over it because it's the hand sketches that sold it to the, all the partners. And then once you do that, then you then you get in a little designer box and they bring you into the office with all the other partners <laughs> and you get to sketch with them instead of doing the bathroom details upstairs. I'm, I'm a big fan of SketchUp. There are times where I can be drawn into putting too much detail on SketchUp. But I want to do enough detail or, or enough modeling that I can then take the pen and trace yeah. and, you know, explore uh, from that massing model. But what's great about SketchUp is you don't have to construct the perspective. It's there, the proportions, you know, you can play with the proportions with your pen, but you can, you know, at least get it close, yeah. you know, in a model, you can move around it. I do similar things. In fact, I'll even model like material sizes. So if I'm checking out board sizes or some certain right. kind of detail, I'll just copy that across the face of something. Um, and it ends up being a quick way to test ideas. Then of course you're, you're sketching over the top of it, right? Using it as a base layer, it, it is a good hack and you can be fast. Now I do think there are, this was, you know, early two thousands when I got into SketchUp. Yeah. So I think, you know, nowadays there are programs that have caught up with it. And, you know, are, you know, probably just as good. But for me, I, I know it so well, it works for me. And it's also the kind of thing that I find is super intuitive for people to use and interact with. So like SketchUp models, you can easily send to clients for right. them to spin around and, you know, interact with, and you can sort of have a viewer on your iPad. And I just always found that the learning curve for that, I mean, it's free, number one, right? <laughs> <laughs> fast, free, and easy to manipulate, intuitive. I mean, this is just so much more accessible. So yeah, I think it's still pretty relevant, actually. What's nice about it, I find is, and we use ArchiCAD for our construction documents, we're a Mac-based office, okay. purely a Mac-based office. And, you know, we, ArchiCAD is a monster and it's super expensive. Yeah. Um, but if, if you want to do a conceptual design, you know, and start with a blank piece of paper in ArchiCAD, it's tough because in, in comparison to uh, SketchUp, you know, in ArchiCAD, if I want to make a window opening, you know, it starts ask ArchiCAD starts asking me a bunch of questions about the window. You know, that I don't want to answer how thick is the glass? What's the jam thickness? You know, what's your sash size? 
I don't want to go there yet. Right. Um, and SketchUp affords you that opportunity to just cut an opening just yeah, um, be and move that wall. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I fell in love with it. What's a typical workflow for you guys? Someone comes to the office and they're interested in hiring you. Walk us through what that process is like. I mean, do they have, do you guys have an interview process? And I realize during COVID it's probably a little different, but you know, do you have a waiting list? Like how does it, how does that work? It, you know, it starts out with a video conferencing tool called GoToMeeting. We're, we're getting to know our clients as best we can, you know, with that tool. Um, our clients and their, their site, our first you know, step is, okay, let's walk the property with you. Usually our clients are absolutely in love with their property. And, and that's actually a, a cue for us. Like it's a part of what can make a good, good client is an appreciation for what they have. We try to ask a ton of questions. And then, and really that's probably what we're doing more often yeah. than anything else. Is yeah. Teasing question, out, question, right? Question. Yeah. yeah. Like being open. So don't, don't show up there on site with a solution. All right. I know what we're doing here. You know, I, you know, what's funny though. I, sometimes I feel like people have that expectation that as an architect, you have this special set of eyes that when you arrive in a place, you immediately know what the right solution is. And so for me, it's oftentimes it's about educating the client beforehand about that process, that it is this kind of incremental iterative process that we learn a little bit, you know, Every time we meet together, I learn more about the client. I also learn more about the site by spending time out there. Or, you know, we have to sort of pick and choose the the sort of overlay of restrictions that are going to guide the design process, right? Because you're you're talking about the site, right? But the site has all these this huge set of restrictions. Then, of course, you have your your client's tastes, and then you have budgets, and you have like laws and regulations and what you can and can't do. And you know, so it's it's interesting. Um, to hear you guys kind of, you guys really zone in on the site as your sort of first play in the design process. Is that right? You're sort of gathering a bunch of lines and it sounds simplified. The first few marks that you make on paper, you're going to start making some lines and you start out with thousands of lines and they're all are informed by what you learned about the person that you were working for and their site. And so you know, some of those lines might be, you know, the solar orientation, mm -hmm. you know, the wind patterns, you know, some of those lines might be regulatory and what you've learned from the survey. Some of those lines might be bearing points on a particular island view or lots of different lines just add up to this massive puzzle. <laughs> yeah. And, and what your goal of an architect to do is gather all those lines together and, you know, start making those marks on the blank piece of paper and then you're slowly pulling out the ones you don't need anymore till eventually there's a design revealed. Sometimes it's the, it's the lines that you don't draw, the information you don't put in there that the client then interprets in a certain way. That's the thing that, that moves the design process forward. And I, and I see so much of that in your sketches, but I also think this is guy who walks on site and like that's in his head. Like <laughs> I think that, and, and I know, and I know better as an architect, I really want to get into that okay, we've, we've started gathering all this information. And then at a certain point, you have, you have to start making the marks on the paper. Can, like, I really want to know what that process looks like. Right. Can, can we use Englishman Bay Retreat as an example? How did it come to be? What, what, did, what preconceptions did they come to you with, if any? And how did that process go? Our client at, at Englishman Bay, I designed a home for his cousin. And it was, you know, two miles north of this site. And so he just out of the blue called us one day and he was describing something um, that, you know, for me uh, personally was exciting. And it, it was, okay. I think, because he was talking about it like the images that were going through my head were like Swiss Family Robinson treehouse you know based on our treehouse discussion earlier you can tell i was like i was all in like, yeah, yeah tell me more yeah you know? i came to learn this later but he had lost a a daughter in life um which had to be a tremendous blow to him mm -hmm. well he had two other you know two daughters still in his life and you know obviously his wife as well and this place and spending time with them here in maine on the coast with their family was super special. Mm. And, you know, he didn't say that in the first conversation. What he talked about was all these cool things he wanted to do with his daughters, you know. And, you know, one of the things he mentioned was sitting under the stars and looking up at the sky with a telescope, you know. And 
he described, you know, opening, opening a hatch on a sailboat and climbing up to the top deck and, you know, being under the stars and a sleeping bag and tent. Come on. Yeah. What client says this in the first phone call? Yeah, <laughs> You're like, I know. Of course so, I want this project. <laughs> when know, do we start? Yeah. Yeah. When do we start? Exactly. So, you know, the site itself, um, has been in his family for a long time and he sort of grew up running around in these woods. The entire understory in the, in the woods there is covered with sphagnum moss. Mm. And so you're walking around on kind of the spongy, you know, I'm sure you've, you've seen it before. It's but, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is everywhere there. And, you know, he described really loving that his parents own a cabin in the, oh, in the okay. next property over. And that, that's where he had, you know, as a kid sort of spent time, they would traverse across the property that the, tr- the retreat is on now to a pebble beach. And over time, they had basically worn a path across this property. As I'm thinking about marks, the first marks that you're making on a page, like that pathway becomes one of those marks, right? And you don't know what that's going to lead to. You don't know what that means. Here's an edge. Yeah. You know, edges. You think of a puzzle, I got to find the edges of the puzzle. Totally. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was one edge I found. There was also a very tall, rocky outcrop, just as high as the first floor level is, you know, in the house right now, which the house sits up on steel columns. I mean, that's a very conscious decision right in itself. I'd be interested to hear how that. Yeah, Yeah, how that happened. Part of it was that rocky outcrop, you know, influenced that because that rocky outcrop, when you're standing next to it, you feel kind of in a bit of a depression for where the house wanted to go. Sure. And so your ability to sort of experience the coastline and the water were, you know, affected by that. And I would say also it was influenced by our client in that first conversation we had about a treehouse. Yeah. Essentially. It feels like a bit of a treehouse. Yeah. So you're out on site assimilating all this information that's coming in from the client and you are you have some understanding of what the program is, I'm assuming at this point, right? What spaces are you actually going to be designing? The rough square footage. What does that first kind of conceptual like are you doing three concepts? Or are you doing just just sketching? Are you sketching out there? Are you like, how does that, what what are the nuts and bolts of that process? What does that look like? Is it three schemes? Is it, tell me about that. It was, you know, two schemes. You know, the other scheme, I essentially separated the living space, completely separated the living space from the bedroom space. And they were sort of two bars, if you will, Mm -hmm. you know, connected by a bridge. Mm -hmm. The, This, the resulting scheme that they sort of fell in love with was, um, more of, you know, still the living and the bedroom wings were absolutely separated, but it has more of a sort of courtyard like feel to right. it. Yeah. Um, and it wraps in a U U shape, which the way I described it to him is that the U shape was a continuation, if you will, of the trail along the water that they had worn into the woods. And I wanted to bring that path or, or trail into the house so that, uh, you know, as you sort of traverse the circulation of that you, you are inwardly looking at the rest of the house and the activity that's going on in there. And, and at the same time, the trees, branches are brushing against the windows and you're sort of traversing that. You know, coming up with that story and that narrative is just as important as the marks you make on paper. It's one of the things that I love most about residential architecture is there you know, rather than the 150 or 50 person firm experience that we had there, where it's all about slam, 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 get it right. This, you have some room to think and, (laughs) you know, conceptualize and actually put together a story that someone can really buy into. And it sounds like your client came to you with sort of a, maybe a kernel of an idea. And and it it was you who started sort of writing the plot and infilling the details and really coloring the characters in it. The narrative quality of architecture is what separates it from being just, you know, anyone can design a house. I mean, we've all lived in homes. We all know what they feel like. And we probably would design one very similar to what our childhood experience was because that's home. That feels comfortable. But you know, the job of the architect is to really, as you say, synthesize all of this disparate information and, and hang it around a story, you know, what makes this place so unique and so cool. And that, that I think is a particular gift of yours to, to be able to look at the, all that information, but then build that story that resonates with that client. So is the presentation then all hand sketches? Is it like, do you like before 
you know, as I'm looking at some of those sketches, that project, you have like a site analysis that you're doing. Like, is, is that literally the starting point? And then you start developing the floor plans from there and elevations or how does it actually come into being? Well, j just as much as you have to tell a story and, and, and come up with a narrative for the design, you don't want to be so far ahead of your client that they aren't a part of the process. That's, that's what I think uh, drawing has the ability to do better than a computer can. When you are sketching and drawing, it allows the viewer to fill in the pieces that aren't photorealistic with, you know, their interpretation of what they're seeing. And, you know, they become a part of iterative process that you're sort of undertaking much more so than if you show up and say, hey, here's your house. It's done. We don't show them everything at the beginning. We got to start with, you know, hey, here's here's your site. Here's all of the lines that we've sort of gathered from the survey, from our site visit, uh, from Google Earth. When we were on site, we noticed there's this beautiful moss-covered boulder that, you know, is special. And here it is, you know, on our drawing, sort of identifying all these things. Because what you want to do is you want them to kind of be there looking over this yeah. with you and saying, oh, yeah, that's special. That's important. Because if you're able to do that, then moving forward, they're they're in the they're in the boat with you. <laughs> totally. You know, yeah. you don't you don't want them in the other boat. <laughs> right. You know, sort of not understanding what what's happening. You want them to be a part of what's happening. But um, the other scheme that you had, I presume you you presented both schemes. Yeah. Yeah. So what's what's why they get in one boat and not the other? What's the was it all story or was it the visuals? I mean, what's your what do you think you know, pushed them? I, I always, I always feel like you almost have to have uh, two or three schemes to sort of show your client that you have proved this out. And you may have one that you want to sort of guide them to, yep. but you can't get there if you only show them one. I think it would be almost impossible because they will always be wondering, well, was there another solution that we should have looked at or not? Yeah. So you, you've got to show them at least two or three schemes. And, and the way I look at it, is you, you want to sort of show them what they're expecting to see or you perceive they're expecting, but also show them something that um, they weren't expecting. It's, that one was two schemes and they pretty quickly, like they just gravitated toward the, the one that you ended up with or was there, was there a back and forth? Because sometimes I show them things and, and they're like, well, I definitely don't like that. And that helps to kind of point you in the right direction too. What happened was on that particular site, okay, the Rocky Outcrop sits in the sort of middle of two completely different views. Okay. One, yeah. one is wide open ocean where it is expansive, uh, windy, noisy, waves crashing. That Rocky Outcrop divided in that wide open, somewhat scary southeast view from the calm, cove, much more intimate, more wooded side mm -hmm. of, you know, the other side of the rocky outcrop. And it was just a sort of natural fit. When I described it to the client at the first presentation, you know, the, the scheme that we ended up with fit that divide much better than the previous one. Did. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, being able to say, that's where the bedrooms belong, the quiet side. And this is where the living space belongs. Big view side, noisy side. That sold it, you know, I think for them. I'm looking at this sort of um, presentation, and I don't know if this is your presentation board, but it has a site plan with the sort of maybe some of these marks that you're talking about. It's got prevailing winds. It's got the solar aspect. It's got views and things like that. And then you have sort of three perspective views of the house. Is that something you presented to? Like, was that the presentation? Uh, yeah, I think it was. Um, I think, you know, what, what ended up happening in, in this particular presentation is I actually flew out to Boulder, Colorado, where they live. Uh -huh. Because at that time, we were um, working at such a distance from them, and they could not travel to Maine for the presentation. I felt like I needed to show up with as much as possible in order to sort of somewhat be efficient. Normally, we probably would not show the perspective in the first presentation, because if you start start showing the perspectives, um, sometimes they're not totally on board and not ready for that. So you want them to buy into the the uh, the site diagram and the plan first. So it's a site diagram, really, because I mean that's where I start too. I mean I would start with a site plan just 
knowing conceptually, like you said, okay, this is where the living spaces are. Sleeping spaces are here. This is generally how you're going to arrive to the site. But then, I mean, there, there has to be a massing component to it too, right? You have to be thinking about this thing mm -hmm. in three dimensions. I mean, naturally, as you're sketching, I imagine this idea evolved. The, the idea of a treehouse, obviously, is it's up lifted above the ground. Can you talk about like, how does the three dimensional component, like, where does that start for you? And I would be blown away if I was a client and I saw these <laughs> conceptual drawings because they are, they are, I see them as conceptual. Not everything's figured out. And, but also as an architect, I think, wow, I mean, that's a lot to invest in like one of say maybe three schemes. Um, so talk about that process and how it evolves. Like, do you see this as you're sketching? You're like, oh yeah, this is definitely lifted up. And this is a tower piece over here, or how does that come to be? You know, people outside the architecture world think that you start in one one end of the sort of blank piece of paper, end up in the other corner, and you're done. You know, <laughs> and it just doesn't happen that way. It's it's a collection of lines, and I I think the same thing applies to the 3D aspect of this. You know, while while I'm sort of diagramming on the site, and and, and I want to sort of emphasize this because I I've learned this drawing at sort of one to twenty scale for me is important because I'm able to sort of, you know, look at the big picture. I think it's easy for a young architect, and I did this when I was younger, <laughs> it's easy to, you know, jump into the detail and start drawing at quarter inch scale. Well, what happens is you forget about sort of all those lines that are coming in from further away. And so I've, I've forced myself to come up with a floor plan at one to 20 scale. It's tiny. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> But what, what happens is, you know, I'm thinking 30,000 foot view and remembering, okay, that's the big open ocean view. That's the quiet cove side. My approach is from, you know, this side of the house. What does that mean, um, you know, to the internal spaces? You know, I learned this from a guy by the name of Jim Leggett. I showed up at a AIA convention in Chicago one year and he was given a presentation he talked about draw as small as you possibly can. He would draw these, you know, very small perspectives and sketches, and then he would take them over to a copier, blow them up, mm. you know, and then, you know, and then it would just develop over time and get more and more detailed with a larger scale. Love it. I um, always found it really intimidating to start a project at a larger scale because I felt like the plans felt open and undeveloped <laughs> in a way because there's, like you said, there's like so much you don't know about the building. So just starting at that small scale is a great hack for really they're conde these condensed pieces and it forces you to think in, in just a larger scale, like approach. And I presume you were thinking about these masses and volumes as being like, okay, well, this is lifted in the air and right. this is a tower. And I mean, do those elements all start as kind of geometry, like square geometries, like orthogonal pieces, or are they, are you, do you say, well, that's a view. So I want this to be a shed roof or how does that work? Speaking specifically to the, the Englishman Bay retreat, um, you know, those, those two sides that I mentioned earlier of that rocky outcrop turned into two wings of the house. And I always sort of try to think in terms of, you know, less complex when it comes to 3D, the less complex, the better, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially here in Maine, I feel like in order to sort of shed snow and rain as simply as possible. So those two wings, in my mind at the time, I knew I, you know, wanted to shed water, you know, in a certain direction, but the plan has to work first. Mm -hmm. And it's a part of training my mind to not sort of like try to figure it all out all at the same time. Yeah. Which, you know, would lead to, you know, the inability to put a mark down. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's paralyzing. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, or get writer's cramp, whatever it might be, yeah. you know, you, you just can't do it. Yeah. So those two wings, I knew, you know, where those were headed. And then I also knew, you know, in, in speaking with the client and, you know, working this through with him and him wanting this amazing sort of rooftop deck that he could spend time under the stars with his daughters. Yeah. You know, that was another sort of guiding principle. And it turned into the tower. When, you know, when you are up there in the evening is sure. it feels like the edge of the earth. It's just an, an amazing spot. So I, I knew I had this sort of vertical element and I, and I knew I had these two wings. And in plan, I, I knew I wanted to keep it simple. I mean, does budget ever, when does budget come up? I mean, we all know it's a big part of this thing, right? Um, but it's something that I think a lot of architects don't really talk about. Is that a first phone call kind of thing for you? It or? has to be a part of the conversation. It has to be. Otherwise, I feel like 
you're setting yourself up for failure. We don't want to be inefficient in our process and, you know, draw all the way to the end and realize, oh, <laughs> this isn't going to work. This right. is way out of my budget. Yeah. So we have the conversation from the beginning and we will be very candid with them, you know, based on what we're working on. And we've got 10 to 12 projects going on at a time and we're seeing these budgets come in. We're able to say, hey, here's what we're seeing, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and, you know, let that inform our process. Okay. And, and I would say also we have an incredible respect for the build community here in, yeah. in Maine. Yeah. And there are some incredible builders. And, you know, we tell our clients, we want that person that's going to be building your home on this team as soon as possible. I want our contractor to have some ownership, you know, to just be handed a set of instructions and say, OK, build this, right. <laughs> you know, without ever having input on it. it I, I wouldn't be able to do that as a builder. I'd much rather, you know, hey, you guys thought about this? What about that? And, and let them be a, a team member. As I look behind you, I see a wall full of books. And like, you know, my instinct is to go grab some of those because I see a bunch that I don't have. What right. Do you have favorite books or resources? I mean, you, you must be someone who references these books all the time. They, um, wh what, what are some favorite resources that you have? They're maybe not beautiful picture books, which mm -hmm. I love those as well. I love picking up the, you know, Tom Kundig and um, looking through, you know, beautiful architecture and drawings. I love that. But there are other books that I also appreciate just reading sort of the methodology behind coming to the narrative. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a book, uh, called the good house contrast as a design tool. And it's like, it's a read, it's about using contrast, you know, in, out, up, down, dark light, and how that applies to architecture, being able to develop a narrative off of those principles and those methodologies can make it feel so much less abstract to a client finding the, the edge between light and dark. If you think about, you know, everybody wants to sit in the window at the restaurant, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. it's at the edge of dark and light so and true. it's a beautiful spot. Th the book is about that. And, you know, all of those contrasts that can, you know, inform your design. Love it. Um, you know, it's interesting because when I hear you talk about walking this site, you know, and, and talking through these ideas with your clients, it, it, and hearing you talk about this idea of contrast just reminds me that I think one of the things that architects bring to the design process, whether that's a house or a commercial building or a school, um, is this ability to see things which you may sense and feel, but uh, aren't immediately obvious. Because when you mm -hmm. were talking about that site, I think about, you know, not only the light contrast of light and dark, but also this idea about sound and, mm -hmm. you know, changing of seasons and what it smells like and how it feels underfoot, yeah. like all of yeah. those senses, bringing those to bear on the story of design is, um, it's so relatable to the client. And, and like you say, um, you know, that's the thing that invests them in the design process and makes it a richer project. And I, uh, you know, I just want to commend you for your work. I really admire your design work and I admire your ability to talk about your process in a real down to earth way. I think that is what makes you successful in, in um, realizing these really beautiful projects. And thanks for taking all this time. This is so much time you've given me. And for as someone who is also a principal in a firm, I know how valuable that is. So really appreciate it. Hey, I love this. Fun. Talk, Talk to, to you later. soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye.